So we're going to continue our talk about exponents. Um, we've been talking about how to deal with exponents, whether we're multiplying like bases, dividing like bases, if we're raising a power to a power, what we do with zero exponents, or an exponent that is a zero, uh, negative exponents, all that kind of stuff. And we want to extend that conversation to exponential functions. We've been talking about functions. We've been reviewing functions. Remember a function is some machine that takes an input, um, does something with that input, and spits out a number that we call an output. Remember, inputs are x's, they're your domain, um, all that stuff means the same thing. Your outputs are your y's, or your range, all that stuff means the same thing. And so functions map those inputs to outputs. They, they map your x to your y. They map your domain to your range. And that map for your x and y creates points that are going to be a part of that function. We need to remember all of that because we're going to start talking about how to graph exponential functions uh, today. So we need to be able to evaluate and graph exponential functions. Okay? Um, so, got some definitions. An exponential function, there are different types of functions, right? We've been talking about linear functions a lot. Linear functions give you a line when you graph them. That's why they're called linear. Um, I mean, there are other reasons why they're called linear function, but that's one. We talked about absolute value functions, and those graphs look like Vs. Remember that those, those Vs we were graphing? Exponential functions, the graphs are going to be a little less um, predictable um, and so we're going to have to go back to basics when, we, when it comes time to graph those functions. But an exponential function is a function that contains a variable in the exponent. It looks like this. Okay, a function of the form y equals a times b to the x. Every function has a y and an x in it. Because, again, it's supposed to map x's to, you know, to specific y's. And so we have to have a place to plug in inputs. So we have to have an x to plug in our inputs. And we have to have a y to show us what our outputs are going to be when we plug in that input. So the x in an exponential function is an exponent. And that's the first time we've seen that. Um, now, there are some limitations, right? And you see those limitations here. In an exponential function, this a right here cannot be 0 which makes sense if it were zero, anything times zero is zero, and our exponent would go away anyway. So A can't be zero. B can't be one, which makes sense again, because if B were one, one to the any power is just going to stay one. And so we lose this uh, exponential short, uh, sort of characteristic of this function. And then this also says that B has to be greater than zero, but that's not necessarily the case either. So um, we don't have to worry about that so much. Um, now, the other thing is x needs to be a real number. Our inputs need to be real numbers, which makes sense. That's the only type of numbers that we've been plugging in anyway. OK? So that's an exponential function. It has an exponent of the variable. Your x is going to be an exponent. Now, how do we evaluate exponential functions? Again. If I want to take an input and find out what output is mapped to it, how do I do that? Okay, Remember that this f of x is just notation. That's all that is. f of x and y are basically the same thing. They're interchangeable. That's just notation. So what I want to do is I want to find out what the value of the function is. What's the output when I put 3 in? Right. So again, more notation. I want to know what f of 3 is. That's just notation. Nothing to do there. All, that, all that's designed to do is to show us that we're putting 3 into the function. Well, we have to literally put 3 into the function. And so we're going to put 3 in for this x. And we have to figure out what negative 3 to the third power is. Well, negative 3 times negative 3 is 9. 9 times negative 3 is negative 27. So this particular function maps 3 to negative 27. That's the x and y that go together. So that creates a point. That point would be part of this function's graph if we were to graph it. We need to understand that because it's going to come in handy in just a couple of minutes. Okay. So uh, evaluate number 2. We want to put x, we want to put 2 
in as an input and see what comes out. Stop the video, take a second, and see what you come up with. Okay, so we're going to plug 2 in for x. When we do that, we get negative 3 squared. The difference between this guy and this guy are the parentheses, and so make sure you're careful about that. This means we have to square the 3, which is 9, and then multiply it by negative 1, which is negative 9. So this particular function takes an input of 2 and maps it to negative 9. So 2 comma negative 9 would be a point on this function's graph. Okay? We've got another one for you to do. See if you can't figure out what the output is for this input. Okay, so again, we're going to plug in 4 for this x. Negative 4 times 2 to the 4th. Well, we've got to do 2 to the 4th first. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. 16 times negative 4 is negative 64. So this particular function, that machine, takes 4 as an input and maps it to negative 64. Okay? And again, that point would be on this function's graph. Okay, speaking of graphing, okay, um, we, need to un we need to be able to graph these functions. Remember, the whole point in graphing is to show all the points that would satisfy this uh, function. And if we keep doing, uh, talking about this in the same context that we have been, the graph is designed to show us all of the possible inputs and what all of those possible inputs would map to as far as outputs go. So what inputs would match what outputs? So we could keep putting numbers in and keep inputting numbers as inputs into the function and see what you know, all those outputs would be, but there's an infinite number of inputs that could be put in. And so a graph is designed to show us those mappings without having to go in and plug in every single last input. Now, graph it. We don't know what this graph looks like. And we didn't know what absolute value graphs looked like. So in order to find out what they looked like, we just started plugging in some inputs, see what those outputs were that were coming out, match them up, plot the points, and see what kind of shape sort of establishes itself. That's what, we, what we're going to have to do here. So we create a bunch of inputs, and it can be whatever you want. You can choose any inputs that you want. Here, we're going to go ahead and give you some. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And we choose those because they tend to be the easiest numbers to plug in. For each of those inputs, we've got to figure out what output matches it. So in order to do that, we literally put those into the function, just like we were doing before. So 2 to the negative 2 power, okay? Negative exponents. We have to drop that down into the denominator leaving a 1 behind in the numerator to make that exponent positive. 2 squared is 4. So when we put negative 2 into this function, 1 fourth comes out. So one of our points on our graph is negative 2 comma 1 fourth. We can even go graph that if you'd like right now before we do the other ones. Negative 2 is on the x-axis is here. This is x. And 1 fourth would be just above the x-axis, right there. Okay? All right. Well, what maps, what matches with negative 1 as an input? We plug negative 1 into the function, drop that base down because the exponent's negative, and we see that negative 1 maps to 1 half. So negative 1 as an input maps to 1 half as an output. Negative 1 on your x-axis maps to one-half in your output. What if you plug in zero? Two to the zero power. Two to the zero power is one. Anything to the zero power is one. So that tells us that zero matches with one. So if we go to zero on the x-axis, it's going to match with one to, on the y. Let me keep going. Two to the first power is two. I'm going to go ahead and do this last guy. 2 squared is 4. So that means that the rest of our points on our graph, 1, 
not the rest of our points, but two more points on our graph are 1, 2 and 2, 4. So we go to 1 on the x-axis and go up to 2 on the y. 2 goes to 4. And we can kind of see a shape start to, to, to form. And so what we see is that this exponential function is going to get really, really close to the x-axis, but never actually touch it. Your y will never actually be 0. Your output, there's no input that will match exactly to a 0 of, of, um, as an output. Okay, so it gets really close to the x-axis, and then once it passes the y-axis, it really explodes up. The bigger input you put in, the quicker your output will jump up. It will go up really, really fast. So it curves up like that. Okay? I know I kind of missed that point there, but that's okay. All right? So that's it. That's how we do this. Okay? A little quicker. And we're going gonna to keep these same inputs. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, because, again, those are the easiest to plug in. So if we plug negative 2 into this function, negative 3 to the negative 2 power, got to drop the base down, we get negative 1 over 3 squared, which is negative 1 ninth. Remember that that negative doesn't go with the 3. They're not in parentheses together, so the 3 is separate. So one of our points in our graph, negative 2, negative 1 ninth plug in negative 1. The 3 has to drop down into the denominator, leaving a negative 1 behind. 3 to the first power is just 3. So negative 1 to the negative 1 third power is another point. Plug in 0. Negative 3 to the 0 power. 3 to the 0 is 1. There's a negative out front, so that becomes negative 1. And so 0 common negative 1 is another point on our graph. Keep going. 3 to the first power, this just becomes negative 3. Negative 3 squared becomes negative 9. And so we have more points on our graph. 1 common negative 3 and 2 common negative 9. We can start plotting those. Negative 2 common negative 1 ninth would be right here. We'd be below the x-axis, right? Negative 1 comma negative 1 third would be right here, again, below the x-axis. 0 comma negative 1 would be right here. 1 comma negative 3 would be right here. And 2 comma negative 9 would be right here. And so, you, again, you get an idea of the shape of this thing. It's going to get really close to the x-axis, never actually touch it. Once it passes the y-axis, boom, it really explodes. But this time it's going to explode down instead of up, and that's because of this negative out front. Okay. All right, so that's what your graph is going to look like. And unfortunately, there's no pattern that we're trying to get to here. We're just going to have to keep plugging in these same inputs to see what we get out, map the inputs to outputs, plot the points, and see where the graph's going to go. Okay. All right, so take a shot at this guy. Now, there's a half. Your A is a half. And so we're going to have to sort of deal with that. But give it a shot. See what you come up with. Stop the video. And then before you plot your points on your graph, uh, start the video again and check your inputs and outputs and make sure that they're right. Okay? Okay, did you get these? This is a little tougher with the one half out front. But if you plug in negative 2, it's going to map to 1 over 32. And here's how. So we're going to plug in four, negative 2 for x. We're going to get 4 to the negative second power right here. And then, of course, since the exponent's negative, we have to drop that down into a denominator, leaving a 1 on top. So we get 1 half times 1 over 4 squared. 4 squared is 16. So now we're here, 1 half times 1 over 16. And when you multiply straight across, you get 1 over 32. And you can see how that works for the rest of these. Plug in negative 1. For x, you have to drop that 4 to the negative 1 into the denominator, get 1 half times um, 1 fourth, and that's 1 eighth, 0, 
4 to the 0 power is 1. 1 half times 1 is 1 half. Plug in 1. 1 half times 4 to the first. 1 half of 4 is 2. And then plug in 2. 1 half times 4 squared. 4 squared is 16. Half of 16 is 8. Okay? So let's go plot our points. Negative 2 to 1 over 32. It's going to be like right here. Uh, negative 1 would be 1 over 8, would be like right here. And then we have 0, 1 half, and then 1 goes to 2, and 2 goes to 8. And so we have an idea of the shape of our graph, and so we graph it, and there it is. Okay? Hopefully that makes enough sense. Just plugging in negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And um, seeing what you get out, match those um, inputs and outputs, plot your points, and draw your graph. Okay? Uh, there's another one here where your uh, A is a negative 0.2, and that's uh, even a little tougher than the fraction sometimes, although you can just plug that into your calculator, okay? Uh, so if we plug in negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, uh, we can do this real quick together maybe. Um, so we're going to plug in negative 2 for x. We get 5 to the negative second power. Negative second power means we have to drop that 5 into the denominator, so we get negative 0.2 over 5 squared, negative 0.2 over 25, right, so now we've got to divide negative 0.2 by 25, and we get negative 0 0.008, so those will match up, okay, negative 0.2 times, now 5 to the negative first power, we're going to have to drop that down into the denominator, 1 over 5, Multiply these straight across, we're going to get negative 0.2 over 5, which gives us negative 0 0.04. Negative 0.2 times 5 to the 0 power is 1, so we get negative 0.2, so we're going to map those up. Plug in 1, so we get negative 0.2 times 5 to the first power, which is just 5, and this becomes negative 1. And then negative 0.2 times 5 squared is 25. And we get negative 5. So some of those numbers start to normalize a little bit. So a negative 2, we're going to be really, really close to the x-axis, but just below it. Negative 1 is going to be the same thing. 0 is not a whole lot further away from the x-axis. Um, 1 gives us negative 1, and 2 gives us negative 5. And so our graph would be something like this. Okay. There you go. Okay, if this, you're still having a hard time plugging these in, make sure you come in and see me, and we'll walk through some more. Okay. Now, what if you don't have the function uh, or even the graph? What if you have a set of inputs and outputs? We need to be able to identify if a function is an exponential function or a linear function or any other kind of function, really. But for right now, we're going to worry about distinguishing between a uh, linear function and an exponential function just from a table of values. Okay, And so you see here. If all the x values in a table have a constant difference, if we're adding or subtracting the same amount each time, and all of the y values have a constant ratio, in other words, if we're multiplying or dividing by the same amount each time, then the table represents an exponential function. Okay? Um, we need to talk about how to recognize a linear function, uh, but we'll do that through a series um, of examples, I think. All right. So, for example, this guy. Here are your inputs, right? 
And if you look, our inputs, they increase by one every time. We add one every time. So that's what we mean by uh, a constant difference. Okay? If the x values have a constant difference. Now, if you look, the difference in your outputs and your y values, they were constantly multiplying by two. So the difference between one and two, we multiply one by two to get two. We multiply two by two to get four. Multiply four by two to get eight. So since they're multiplying by the same, they have a constant ratio, then this is an exponential function. Okay? Now, an example of a linear function might be something like this. If your um, x values have a constant difference, so we're adding one every time, and our y values might have, it would have to have a constant difference as well, right? Not a constant ratio, but a constant difference. We're adding one every time, then it would be a linear function. Or to keep in line with um, the same type of example here, Instead of multiplying by 2 every time, if we were adding 2 every time, it would still be a linear function. Add 2, add 2, add 2. If you graph these points, you're going to get a line. You graph these points, and you're going to get these funky exponential graphs that we're, we've been doing. Okay, there's the difference. Whether you're multiplying a difference every time, or if, if you have a, a constant ratio, or a constant difference. Okay, let's see if that makes any sense. So number eight, determine whether each of the following tables re represent an exponential function. Explain why or why not. Okay, well, first look at your x values and make sure that we're talking about a constant difference in these guys. And we are. We're adding one every time. Then what is going on with your y values? The first thing I would look to see is, do the, is there a constant difference? Right? If I add 4 I get to 2, I get 6. If I add 4 to 6, I get 10. If I add 4 to 10, I get 14. So this is a constant difference, which means that if we were to graph this, it would give us a line. So this is not an exponential function. It's actually a linear function. Okay, it's actually a linear function. All right? Um, and again, if we were to plot this, and I don't have a grid here, but I can make a quick sketch for you. It should be fairly accurate. So at 0, we would go up to 2. At 1, we'd go up to 6. So, so let's change this a little bit. We're going to go down here. I need more room. Okay, 0 would go to 2, 1 would go to 6, so I'd go up 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. 2 would go up 4 more, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, and without plotting the third point, you can see it's fairly linear. Alright, so it's going to be a linear function. Okay. Now, check this guy. Determine whether each of the following tables represents an exponential function. Explain why or why not. Okay, well, we didn't explain here, but hopefully that made um, enough sense, right? It's not an exponential function. Why? Uh, because y values do not have a constant, um, y values have a constant difference, not a constant ratio. Okay, so, sorry, if we want to see that. Y values have a constant difference and not a constant ratio. That's why. Okay, now what about this guy? Check your X values first. Is there a constant difference? And there is. We're adding one every time. Now look here. Is there a constant difference here? Well, if I add, uh, if I subtract 6 from negative 3, then I get negative 9. If I subtract 6 from negative 9, I would get negative 15. That's not what we get here. So it's not a constant difference. Okay. Well, how, how else could I get from negative 3 to negative 9? Or better yet, how about we divide negative 9 
by negative 3. And we see we get 3. So we multiply negative 3 to get negative 9. Divide negative 27 by negative 9, and you get 3 again. And do the same thing with negative 81 and negative 27, and you get 3 again. So this is all multiplying by 3. So not a constant difference, but a constant ratio. So yes, this is an exponential function. The y values are in a constant ratio. That's how we want to approach that. That's how you can check. An easy way to check is first add, try to add the same number each time to your y's and see if it's a constant difference. If it's not, then start dividing the y's out and see if there's a constant ratio. And there is. Okay? Try this one real quick. See if you can't figure out this guy's an exponential function or not. And then start the video back up and see if you're right. Okay, check the x values first. Make sure we're constantly going up by the same difference. And we are, adding one every time. Now check your y's. Well, to get from this uh, first y to this next y, we have to add a half. Add a half to a half, you get one. Add a half to one, you get one and a half, and that's not what this is. So it's not going to be a constant difference. So then, this is going to be weird, but divide them by each other, right? If we divide by a fraction, we're really multiplying. So one time, or multiplying by the reciprocal, one times two over one is two. Divide two by one and you get two. Divide four by two and you get two. So it's a constant ratio. We're multiplying by two every time. So yes, this is a linear function. Y values are in a constant ratio. Okay? And that's how you check from a table of the values. All right? Now, some story problems in being able to, again, evaluate exponential functions can help us in a couple of different situations as well. Uh, we'll talk more about growth and decay uh, in the next class, but that's where you're going to see a lot of exponential type stuff. So in number 11, suppose a culture of bacteria doubles each hour. There are initially 2,200 bacteria. The function, f of x equals 2,200 times 2 to the x, gives the number of bacteria after x hours. How many bacteria will there be after four hours. And in a lab, this could be a very useful piece of information. We're going to start with 2,200 bacteria and see how this bacteria grows, right? And we think it's going to double. We know it's going to double each hour. And so maybe we can test the medication on it to see if it works, see if it slows down that growth or even takes, uh, even stops it. Something like that, OK? Well, after four hours means we want to try to figure out what the value of this function is at four. So we want to put four into this function right there. So we're going to take 2,200 and multiply it times 2 to the fourth. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. Okay? And when we multiply 2,200 times 16... We get 35,200. So after four hours, there will be 35,200 bacteria. Okay? All right. That's all there is to it. Okay, sorry for that interruption. Um, we got one more problem here to take a look at. So try this. Computer mapping software allows you to zoom in on an area to view it in more detail. The function, 100 times 0.25 to the x, models the percent of the original area the map shows after zooming in x times. What percent of the map shows after zooming in three times? 
So try to work that out, see if you can find out what percent of the map is going to show after zooming in three times. Start the video back up and see if you're right. Okay, and so what did you get? We're going to plug three into our function because that's three times. And then just evaluate that. So 0.25 to the third power. And you can type that into your calculator. 0.25 times 0.25 times 0.25 gives you 0.015625. Now multiply that by 100, and you get 1.56, and this is a percent. So after zooming in three times, you're only going to see 1.56 percent of the map. So you're going to see 1.56% of the original map when you zoom in three times. Okay? All right, hopefully that makes sense. If not, make sure you come see me and we'll hash it out. Homework's out in Canvas. Make sure you do get that done.